everyone. In this episode, I interview Professor Mark Emberton about prostate cancer. I'm Dr. Gail Busby, and this is I Forgot to Ask the Doctor. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning into my podcast. In this episode, I'm going to interview Professor Mark Emberton about prostate cancer. Mark is a consultant urologist and professor of interventional oncology. He has a particular interest in minimally invasive therapies for prostate cancer. He's a prolific researcher and educator, and I feel absolutely honored to have him on the show. Mark, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Gail, well, thank you. Um, Very exciting to be here. Um, This is a subject I like talking about, and um, I'd be very interested in uh, receiving your questions and also uh, those from uh, uh, your podcast listeners. Fantastic. Wonderful. So, Mark, I find it fascinating to find out why distinguished colleagues like like yourself chose to work in certain areas of medicine. So can you tell us what made you decide to work within the area of prostate cancer? So it's a great question um, and one that you'll pro- will probably resonate with you. Um, so when I, when I was training, so I, I, I finished uh, medical school in 1985 and then we, we, uh, we did our house jobs, which is the first job you, you do in medicine. And then we, we lived in the back of our cars and we went around doing six month or yearly jobs. <laughs> Uh, we used to do lots of SHO jobs, essentially, yeah. um, senior house officer jobs. That doesn't exist now. Um, but you never knew what you were going to do next. And and I enjoyed everything I did. So, you know, I enjoyed pediatric, uh, you know, surgery. I enjoyed um, um, general surgery. I, I enjoyed every, every you know, I, was, I did um, cardiac surgery at the Brompton. I thought that was fantastic. So I was really struggling to know what to do. Um, and, and until I... Um, didn't get the job I want, and then went to a hospital I didn't think I wanted to go to, and then met Brian Ellis, um, ah. um, who was the um, huge inspiration in my in my life. Sadly, he he died very recently, um, and uh, I, I gave the eulogy at at, oh. at, um, at his memorial service. And he was just a brilliant man, and um, essentially a general surgeon morphing into urology. So um, specialties are quite recent you know um, and some of the listeners may not may not know that but um, the specialisms that are now commonplace all emerged in the kind of 50s 60s and even 70s um, and and he was there transitioning from general surgery to urology and urology was his love his absolutely true love was the prostate and um, he was obsessed with knowing more about <laughs> it how to manage it better and um, and that enthusiasm rubbed off on me and then we published uh, our first paper together. It was a case report. So in other words, uh, we uh, published a, an interesting case and we published that in the medical literature. Um, and that really got me going. Um, and then, of course, once you've done that once, you get a get a taste for it, a flavor for it. You want to do it again. And, and so I decided to do my research period at the Royal College of Surgeons, uh, running a, a large prostate study uh, that we ran in the early 90s. Um, and, and that... Um, that proved to be quite successful, um, had global impact, um, and, and and there was no going back then. I, I had to be, there was nothing else I could do. All I knew about was prostate. So then I, yes. I finished urology, and it made sense when I uh, became a consultant in 1998 at the Middlesex Hospital, which now doesn't exist. It's been merged with UCL. Um, uh, I, I took a job yeah. in, in urology yeah. in prostate, and 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 that's what I've been doing since. The rest, as they say, is history, right? <laughs> it's, been, it's been a great journey. No, I'm just going to say... I, yeah, it sounds like it. Um, some specialties are... Uh, knowledge is stable. Um, I mean, the specialty that had yeah. extraordinary growth w- when I was um, in the decade before I qualified uh, was orthopedic surgery. So, so it was all about materials, titanium, uh, engineering, uh, and it transformed lives. You know, the, the hip replacement was is an incredible... Um, innovation, probably, probably yeah. the most effective, cost-effective healthcare intervention we have. You know, it transforms lives. It, from being at home, you can you can have a, a productive life and uh, and be pain-free. And and actually, um, in 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 my life, as I think we'll talk about, um, technology allowed us to think about 
uh, prostate disease in a completely different way. And, and that was just chance. I, I just happened to be in the right place at the right, at the right time when technology uh, allowed us to suddenly think differently about a disease. Okay. So, Mark, as you know, this podcast is aimed at educating patients. And for that reason, we try to avoid medical terminology as much as possible in order that it remains as accessible as possible to as wide an audience as possible. So let's start with the basics. Where exactly is the prostate gland and what does it do? So it's tucked away, um, which is which is one of the problems. It's kind of behind the pubic bone, which is the bone um, uh, just above the base of the penis in men. It's the hard bit if you press. Um, it sits underneath the bladder mm -hmm. um, and in front of the rectum. So it's hard to imagine it, that it could be more tucked away than it is. And of course, if you think about that from a from a kind of radiology perspective, so in other words, trying to image it, you've got bone in front, water above, and air behind. So you, you've got these three very different structures that surround <laughs> the prostate. And, um, and each type of imaging you use, whether you use ultrasound or x-rays or MRI or CT, they, they, they are all affected by one or other of those media, bone, solid, uh, yeah, water, or true. gas. Uh, and some are affected by all three. So there was, until very, very recently, there was no real good way of seeing the prostate uh, the only way we could assess it um, was to put a finger in the in the back passage in the rectum and feel the back of the prostate, uh, which sits on the uh, the front part of the rectum, what we call the anterior rectal wall. Um, and that was the only way um, yeah. that we could assess the prostate. And of course, if the prostate was diseased, um, you could only tell if the disease was in the bit that you could feel. So if the disease was elsewhere, you couldn't uh, detect it. Um, and, and so the evolution of, 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 of prostate cancer has, rather, has, has largely been an evolution of the ability to see the prostate. Um, and the first time we could do that was with ultrasound. Um, um, and so that, that uses sound waves. And then we use the reflection of sound waves to reconstruct mm -hmm. images within the body. Obviously, sound waves don't go through bone. They, they, it's like hitting a brick wall. Um, and and so we we eventually yeah. developed the technology so that we would put a probe in the back passage in the rectum, and that pass, that would sit just behind the prostate, and we could image the prostate uh, fairly well. The prostate usually is about the size of a walnut. Um, its job is to uh, make semen. Um, semen protects the sperm and delivers the sperm, uh, and then um, a component within the semen called PSA liquefies the semen and that allows the sperm to enter into the cervix and um and have at least the chance of fertilizing an egg so so the prostate's critical none of us would be here if um if our fathers did not have a functioning prostate i suppose the only way would be through assisted fertility um but but if it was a normal conception yeah. uh you need you need a healthy prostate to make healthy semen to deliver the sperm, protect the sperm, and then to allow the sperm to make contact with the cervix. Um, so that's 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 what it that's what it does. Okay, thank you. That's a really clear explanation. Thank you very much. So, what are the symptoms that could should concern patients? So, really important patient education, really important, um, and. The prostate in many people's minds is a kind of a woolly thing, but you've just explained it really well where it sits and what it does. But what symptoms may occur that should make a man say, oh, I'm a bit concerned about that? What symptoms should make him, prompt him to seek medical attention? There are three things that can happen to the prostate as a man ages. Um, the, the, the one that happens in mm -hmm. all men, in, including myself, is that the prostate grows um, after puberty. Um, so um, uh, boys are born with a very small prostate. Uh, after puberty, that prostate starts to grow. That growth really kind of takes off in the 50s and 60s. Uh, like all things in biology, the rate of growth varies. Some men end up with a huge prostate. Um, I was speaking to a man today with a prostate the size of a small melon, you know, 250 mils 
or, or, or you wow. know, or at least a large grapefruit, um, and who was obviously having problems peeing. Um, so, so that's benign prostatic mm. enlargement, uh, and that's a very interesting process. Most things get smaller as we age, um, apart from prostates, noses, and earlobes. Um, uh, are, the, are the kind of you know key things that that tend to get bigger with age. Interestingly, the process by which that happens is not really very well understood. Um, and we can talk about the consequences of that in a minute. The other thing is that can happen in younger men is inflammation, something called prostatitis, um, and that can result in um, a painful peeing, pain after ejaculation, pain in the testicles, pain between the legs. Um, it's it's a it's a nasty affliction that is very difficult to treat and again ill understood, um, and is and is almost certainly due to inflammation, a bit like asthma is or arthritis is. This is not infective, usually. It's just an inflammatory state. Um, and we treat that with um, anti-inflammatories, sometimes some antibiotics, prostate relaxing drugs, uh, and a lot of physical therapy. And the third thing, of course, uh, and the reason why uh, many of your listeners will be interested today is, is, the, is the risk of prostate cancer. And uh, as a man ages, yeah. the, the risk of developing prostate cancer in your prostate increases year, year by year and decade by decade. In fact, if a man is lucky enough to live to 70 or 80, it's, it's, more, it's more likely than not that they have prostate cancer cells in their prostate. Now, that's not to say that they are going to be troubled by those cells or indeed die of prostate cancer. The majority will not. Um, only five percent of only three percent of people, sorry, will will die of prostate cancer. So the lifetime risk of any individual, including myself, of dying of prostate cancer is about one in thirty. It does make it one of the most common cancers, uh, so it's very prevalent. There's a lot of it, uh, but the risk of dying of it is relatively low. Having said that, about twelve thousand men a year uh, die of prostate cancer, and that can be a slow and painful death um, and, and, and men die because cancer spreads to bone and uh, other parts of the body, um, liver, lymph nodes. Um, and, and, and of course, that process uh, needs treatment um, and can be painful and, um, and can be slow. So, um, so it's something we want to, to prevent. Prostate cancer is curable. Um, when it remains in the prostate, and we'll talk about early detection shortly, I'm sure, um, it is incurable once yeah. it spreads beyond the prostate. But um, there have been amazing advances uh, in, um, in the management of um, advanced disease. So once prostate cancer spreads, and remember, it does so in the minority of patients, um, we used to um, basically just remove the testicles. That's all we could do. So when I was at, when I was, um, at that hospital with... Um, uh, Brian Ellis, who I was talking about earlier, um, I had lists where I had um, mm -hmm. I had to remove men's testicles because that was the only way we could treat prostate cancer that was spread. That was removing the testosterone. Wow. Now there are a, a, an enormous array of uh, hormones, chemotherapy, immunotherapies that can be used um, to help men with advanced prostate cancer. Okay, and. About acquiring the, the disease, I always ask about risk factors because um, with many conditions, there are things, lifestyle things that can be done, which can reduce your risk of contracting or developing whatever condition we're talking about. And we're always really, really interested to hear that. Um, if you don't have prostate cancer, is there anything you can do that can reduce your risk? Are there any risk factors? One, I guess, is age. You've mentioned that before. But what are the risk factors? and is there anything we can do to influence them? So each of the conditions I've described have got d different risk factors uh, associated with them. Let's let's do prostate cancer first. So um, th th un unfortunately, there's there's not much one can do to reduce your risk of getting prostate cancer. Um, it's not like smoking, um, which you know by stopping you stop the risk of lung cancer and bladder cancer and many other conditions. Yeah. Um, now. Um, the the rate at which people get prostate cancer varies around the world and um so in south asia and southeast asia 
uh, the rates, the risk of getting prostate cancer if you um, were born there and grew up there is much, much lower than, say, if you live in Detroit or New York or San Francisco. And so there's a there's a kind of Western element to it. And that's why there's a lot of interest at the moment in diet, lifestyle. And I, I tend to keep it relatively simple um, and say, you know, what's good for the heart and the brain is good for the prostate. And so a good healthy diet, good exercise, keeping the weight off um, is good to reduce dementia risk. It's good for your heart. And I think it's also good for your prostate. Beyond that, it's largely speculative. And there's a huge industry in supplements, lycopenes, antioxidants, saw palmetto, mm -hmm. pumpkin seeds. It goes on and on and on. Um, they're all about a pound a day, 30 pounds a month. Uh, and most of these preparations have those things. Uh, that's an act of faith um, uh, as to whether or not these things um, make a difference. The trials have not shown them to be beneficial to date. That doesn't mean they don't work. Um, and, and many patients choose to take something. Yeah. Now, there are certain groups that are more at risk. Um, so there are there are certain genetic um, BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, uh, so is is a genetic um, risk factor. Uh, and um, but, and one, one tends to see uh, women with ovarian cancer and breast cancer in those families. Um, and prostate cancer tends to be more prevalent. Um, that is... And there are certain groups, cultural groups, Ashkenazi Jews, et cetera, that, that uh, have that BRCA2 mutation, uh, which is more prevalent than in other areas. Uh, black men um, need, are at increased risk, uh, both of getting the disease and also of having more aggressive disease at the time of diagnosis. Nobody quite knows why. Um, there are some genetic factors. Vitamin D. Um, uh, so, so in other words, if... if um, uh, black men live in a northern climate or extremely southern, very southern climate, uh, they might not get enough vitamin D. Um, and that's not the entire story other, uh, either, uh, but they, they're clearly at increased risk. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and there's a, a, lot, a lot of work to try and understand why that is. So the, so the only strategy really for finding prostate cancer early is to, is to come up with a screening program. And what I mean by a screening program is, is to try and identify the disease before it becomes um, clinically evident, in other words, before people present with a problem. And we can talk a bit more about screening in a, in a, in a minute, I think. The, um, the other, but, but with the other prostate conditions, which are probably more common and, uh, and in a kind of global sense have more impact, there's, there's a lot that men can do in terms of um, uh, mod mod modifying their peeing. Uh, so as the prostate gets bigger, sometimes it squeezes the urethra, the water pipe that runs through it, and prevents the bladder from emptying, mm -hmm. um, and and there's there's a lot mm -hmm. a lot men can do uh, in terms of lifestyle, you know. So um, a lot of people get into bad habits with caffeine, coffee, and tea. Uh, coffee and tea stimulate the bladder. Uh, they make you they give you urgency. They make you rush. Um, they, they they if I drink a lot of tea and coffee, and I'm sitting here um, at the screen, I, I I find I have to rush to the loo. It's 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 a real phenomenon. Um, some people um, drink too much for their bladder volumes. Um, we, we measure that with something called a frequency volume chart. Um, and we, we measure everything they drink, everything they pee, and we tot it up. And it's quite interesting. People come to me and say, I, I, I go too often. I get up at night three times. And then we do a chart and um, you find out that they're producing five liters a day because somebody's told them to drink lots. Um, and, um, and, and actually all, all you yeah. have to do is say, look, you know, uh, two liters of urine per day is very healthy. Uh, you could, you can start and, and it goes away. And there are some conditions at night. Um, so nighttime peeing that we investigate a little bit just to make sure that the mechanisms to concentrate urine at night um, are working. Uh, and, and I'm talking about something called nocturnal polyuria. And again, the frequency volume chart, the diary mm -hmm. uh, is very, very useful at identifying uh who those men are and, and they have a slightly different um, uh, we have a slightly different approach to treating them um, we, and sometimes we, we, we use drugs um, but but not before asking them to eat early in the evening and to reduce their fluids at night so there's a lot one can do um, in fact we once did a study of yeah. lifestyle techniques uh, administered by a superb nurse and continence advisor 
um, versus um, standard of care. In other words, no advice. Uh, and the benefit of lifestyle was, was as yeah. good as you can get with all the drugs um, that we've got available for, to, uh, to manage um, voiding disorders. In other words, problems peeing. And so it's, it's a really useful um, intervention that I don't think is used enough. Um, uh, and and men are men are very good because they get feedback very quickly. So if you stop drinking, um, you you notice immediately, and then that reinforces your uh, pattern of behaviour. Whereas many many lifestyle changes, you you have to do it, and then you hope that it makes a difference to um, your heart, or your cholesterol, yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, down the track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so you touched a little bit about screening tests. Um, can you? educate us about what screening tests are available if any for to aid early diagnosis well lis listeners will be aware of prostate cancer listeners will be aware that there is no formal uh, screening uh, system uh, for prostate cancer in the uk or indeed elsewhere in fact uh, next to me is my letter inviting me for my colorectal screen so uh, every which i get every two years so that that is a formal nationally adopted screening uh, program uh, that has been shown to work and saves lives um, in my world, it's a smear test for women yes, yeah. that you get every three years. Uh, and um, hugely, hugely um, important and, 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 and beneficial. Pros prostate hasn't made it to that status yet. Um, and the studies that we've done, there have been many, uh, many, many thousands of men have been recruited into screening studies. Uh, we, we, we failed uh, in many of the studies to show a survival advantage. So, so what I mean here is that if you are screened, uh, we need to demonstrate that by doing so, men on average will live longer because fewer men will die prematurely uh, because the prostate is caught early. And it's been really disappointing for the investigators, but actually the patients um, and, and indeed the non-patients, the, the, the people who want to be screened. Remember, many people that have screening are not patients. They don't attend a hospital. They just want to be reassured that they don't have a certain disease. Um, and it took quite a mm -hmm. while to work out why, and, um, um, and, and many screening programs don't work. And, and I think it's fair to say that, that prostate screening to date hasn't worked particularly well. Um, and on reflection, it's probably because our tools um, were not um, adequate. So PSA, uh, which is a blood test, PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. PSA is the um, component of semen that liquefies the semen. Um, uh, it's in huge quantities in the semen. And when the prostate is diseased, it leaks into the bloodstream. And we exploit that by measuring it uh, in a blood test. And if the PSA is high, you've either got a big prostate or an inflamed prostate or an infected prostate or a prostate that contains cancer or any combination of those four. So you can imagine it's, it's, it's not perfect. Um, you, can, you can have a normal PSA mm. and have cancer. You can have a high PSA and not have cancer. And then we and then we followed that uh, so um, with another test, which was also very unreliable. And that was um, what we call transrectal biopsy. I mean, it sounds terrible. Uh, and, and it is. And it was because we largely replaced yeah. it. And, and that was basically putting a needle into the prostate without knowing where the cancer was. And so a man would present in a screening program with a high PSA. They'd be referred to their hospital for a transrectal biopsy. Um, even 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 the sound of that uh, would put many people off, and it did. Uh, and then the biopsy might, and often did, uh, miss the cancer. So the man was given the all clear when, in fact, they had a cancer that could have been detected. Okay. So that's where we were. Um, now, um, since then, there's been a revolution, um, and, and that revolution I've alluded to earlier has been in imaging. In other words. Um, uh, replacing ultrasound, which was the only way we had to image the prostate, with MRI. And that um, has allowed us to see the cancer very, very clearly. Uh, it allows us to target the biopsies, uh, and it allows us to know exactly what type of cancer the individual has, because we get a bullseye, uh, because we get into the heart of the tumour, and therefore get very representative tissue when we look at it down a microscope. Um, and, and so that that is the transformative technology um, that I think is going to um, at least, well, it's certainly going to be tested as a screening uh, test. Uh, and we are now in discussions with the various agencies um, uh, to see whether or not we can do a study 
uh, to demonstrate uh, that screening is beneficial and not harmful. Um, so what a lot of listeners won't fully understand is, you know, how could any screening program be harmful? Uh, well, well, you know, you're, you're turning um, citizens into patients um, and not there is no perfect test mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And whatever test we use, it'll, it'll be wrong occasionally. And that will result in other tests being required and unnecessary treatments, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to be very, very careful with screening, as, as you will be aware, uh, with an established mm -hmm. screening program. And yeah. the screening has to be done really well. The quality of the imaging and the reporting uh, has to be done very well. And we have to reach all members of society. Uh, this is a, a an issue you'll understand yeah. in, 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 in cervical screening. And in prostate, there are yeah. certain... Um, members of society that are less likely to say yes to an invitation and we're learning a bit more about that um, and we've just done a um, MRI screening project in in in, in London and um, if you were a, an old white man you were very likely to say yes I'll come along for a screening program um, if you were a black man uh, living in a underprivileged part of London uh, you were much much less likely to do so and so there was a huge discrepancy in the um, proportion of individuals that would say yes to an invitation to screen. Now, knowing that's really, really important so that we can, um, you know, be more effective in certain communities and work differently. And maybe just sending a letter is not the right thing. Uh, we have to do uh, lots of other things. So, I've, you know, uh, colleagues have done this and, and working with um, uh, faith group leaders, they found that um, they were much more likely to get um, individuals from certain communities to say yes. Um, people have tried sports venues, pubs, you know, um, to um, to increase increase awareness, uh, and that would be that would have to be a component of any screening program. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And education, isn't it? It's perceptions that often you have to change of what, what is involved. Okay, it's an MR, but what comes after that, you know? And, and that's why, um, opportunities like these are so powerful. You know, if we can get this out and, and, and people can hear you across the society, then, you know, hopefully that'll be a big step forward. And that's one of my big motivations. Just following on from what you said, Gail. So, um, a, a lot of men historically said no to screening because if you're PSA tested positive, um, you had to have this probe put up your back passage and then these parts yeah. um, through the yeah. rectum, which has a high risk of infection and bleeding and, and lots of other things. And so yeah. the prospects of that and a lot of men quite reasonably, actually, um, would say thanks, but no thanks. Uh, now, um, you know, it's just lying down on a reasonably comfortable couch admittedly in a, fair, in a tight space <laughs> if you're claustrophobic you're not very comfortable in there uh, and we're trying to get it down to 10 to 15 minute scan mm -hmm. um and there's a, a lot of science going yeah. on to, to uh, make the scan as quick as possible and one of my colleagues shonet bunwani yeah. uh, is has developed a five minute mri scan uh, that we're currently testing and, and that could wow. be done in in a supermarket or because it doesn't need any injection obviously there's no radiation with an mri yeah. Um, and and if there's no injection, you yep. don't need a doctor present, and so you could do the scan anywhere and really cheap. Yep. Yep. It's safe. It's cheap, and it's non invasive. So ticking a lot of boxes um, for hopefully widespread population coverage. So assuming you did you did go along maybe for your screening test, um, and you had a diagnosis at the end of the, the process, um, you had a diagnosis of prostate cancer, what will have been your journey? So so what can patients expect? What is involved in the diagnosis? So you have the screen, what does come next now in today's modern world, in, in modern medicine, the way it stands now? What's next after screening? Or if you turn up with symptoms, you know, what can a patient expect? So prostate cancer is un un unusual in, in that, um, th th that it depends on the type of prostate cancer, and that and that um, that's really based on the volume and the grade. So the two things that drive cancer are the number of cells. Mm -hmm. So um, if your cancer is about the size of a pea, there are about mm -hmm. 100 million cancer cells there, um, which sounds a lot. Um, 
and, and, and the grade of the cancer. So in prostate, uh, we have very slow growing cancers. Um, typically they're called pussy cats or tortoises. Uh, there are many diagrammatic uh, depictions of this. Um, and, and then we have very aggressive cancers um, that are sometimes called the tigers. Uh, fortunately, very few men have those and they tend to spread. Um, most men have the so-called yeah. pussycat. Uh, if we find that, and actually our screening tests are designed not to find that, um, uh, then we, we, we don't treat. We, we just observe. Nobody dies from Gleason 3 plus 3, uh, which is what we call the, the, the pussycat. Um, the, the, the way that the doctors label the cancers is very confusing. Um, and essentially, they used to be five numbers. Um, but now, to make it all a bit more confusing, there are only three numbers because we got rid of one and two. And we didn't have the sense to recalibrate the scale. So we have three, four, and five. <laughs> three is the pussycat. Five is the all right. And four is the something in between. So, um, so, so, so those are the three numbers we look at. And, and, and some uh, men and families listening to this will be aware of their Gleason score. Um, and what pathologists do when they look down the microscope yeah. is look for the most pr predominant cancer and attribute that a number, three, four or five. And then the second most predominant cancer in the air and attribute that a number. Uh, so four plus three would be worse okay. than three plus four. Three plus four would be mainly three, pussycat with a tiny bit of in-between. Four plus three would yeah. be mainly in-between yeah. one with a tiny bit of three. So um, so if it's low risk, it. we'd Got watch it. it. Um, if it's higher risk, let's well, let's say if it's high risk, uh, we would probably recommend either surgery or radiotherapy. Um, and if it's, if it's medium mm -hmm. risk, uh, and we've caught it early, uh, there is now the option of just treating the cancer and trying to preserve the prostate um, uh, in the way that we do in breast cancer. So that's equivalent to a lumpectomy where you treat the cancer with a margin uh, and you try and preserve tissue um, in, in breast, obviously it has cosmetic benefit in the prostate. It has functional benefit. And by preserving prostate, we can keep men continent. They don't leak urine. Uh, and we can maintain erections uh, in about 95% of the men that we treat if we, if we do that. Uh, unfortunately, um, the treatments affect the structures near the prostate that we described earlier, and that can affect the bladder above, the rectum behind, and the sphincter, which I haven't mentioned yet, uh, which is the muscle that um, uh, you, one uses to keep you dry. So it's a, it's a round muscle that sits just at the lower bit of the prostate, and if if um, if you want to stop your stream, uh, you you, you com your, your sphincter compresses and stops the stream. It's the it's the sphincter that you can control, and, and that can get damaged um, by surgical removal of the prostate, to a lesser extent by radiotherapy. But radiotherapy can damage the the bladder, make it more difficult to pee, and can damage the rectum, which can give men a little bit of leakage and diarrhea. So these are not side effects that people want. They reduce people's quality of life as they as they get older. Um, obviously, technology has got mm -hmm. much, much better. We have robotic surgery now, which is all done through keyholes. Radiotherapy has improved dramatically since, you know, when I was training, we used to shoot from the side, from the left and the right, from the front and the back. Now you have computer guided, image guided radiotherapy, which has enormous precision. And so the side effects are much less than before. Okay, so so we'll go delve a little deeper into treatment in a minute. But so you've taken us from you're in the curl up in the MR scanner <laughs> to you've got a four plus three. Um, how is that diagnosis made? So is that still by transrectal biopsy? No. So um, the scanner will tell you where it is. Oh, is that radiologic? Yeah. So so um, what, uh -huh. what we do now, um, and again the UK. UK's led a lot of this. Um, it's not. It's not. It's not generally known, but the MRI work is all UK-led. Targeted biopsy, which I'll, I'm just going to talk about uh, now, is is largely U, a UK thing, which now the yeah. world has adopted. So um, once we know where the cancer is, what we yeah. do now is is take the information yeah. from the MRI, and this is now using computer science, um, yeah. and then we import 
the MRI information onto the ultrasound and then guide the needles uh, into um, these targets, which are not real targets, they're, they're superimposed on the ultrasound. It's a bit like a, a fighter pilot having a head-up display, um, so the targets are kind of displayed in front of him or her, um, rather than looking down at, um, at the console. And so now, um, uh, th this is called image fusion, and then we can see exactly uh, where mm -hmm. each needle landed because that's recorded uh, and we can sample the prostate mm -hmm. cancer in its entirety and that's done through the skin between the legs no right. more rectum no more risk of infection right no more rectum bleeding. right okay um okay. we can anesthetize between the legs uh, the men right. need to sit with their legs wide apart which they don't like um uh, but there, there's fairness for you from from, from your your specialty yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> and, um, and we can do this under local anaesthetic, we can do it under sedation, and in some cases under general anaesthetic. But it's done as a day case procedure. It takes so about 10, 15 minutes to do, yeah. um, and, and, and is, is, is actually what we call the prostate biopsy now. So that piece of information is so valuable because I think that is going to change, that is a game changer for concept of what people's concepts, certainly what mine was actually, and I'm a doctor, you know? Um, and I think things like that can really remove barriers to people coming along for treatment if they've got symptoms, you know, because there goes the fear of that transrectal, which you're right, sounds horrible. Okay, great, Thank, thanks for clarifying that for me, for all of us. Um, and then going back to treatment, so treatments can be surgical, uh, where you remove the tumour but preserve the gland. It can involve removing the entire gland. Yeah. And it can involve chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Yeah. yeah, so... And then it can involve highly specialised delivery of yeah. treatment. Is yeah, right? we, try, we try to tailor the treatment to, to, to the risk. So um, to, the, to the man, to the prostate yeah. and to the cancer. Um, rather than the other way around. And so um, you can imagine if a, if a man has a, an advanced prostate cancer that extends across the prostate uh, from the left to the right, front to the back, the only way to treat that really is to re either remove the prostate or to irradiate the whole prostate. And that gives a very good margin. The concept of margin is quite important. So um, I think listeners will understand that when we see a cancer, the cancer extends microscopically um, invisibly beyond the limits that we can see, normally for about five millimeters, sometimes slightly more. So um, we always, in, in um, when we're operating on cancer, um, cut not immediately around the tumor. We always leave a little bit of a margin uh, so that there's no microscopic cancer left. And when we're planning treatment, whether it be surgery, radiotherapy, or the focal treatment, so in other words, the treatment directed to the cancer, we always have to apply a margin. And a lot of the thinking is about how much margin do we need? How do we best achieve that? How do we achieve that and minimize side effects? Uh, what are the preferences of the patient uh, in terms of speed, travel, recovery? Um, what side effects does the patient want to avoid most? Because that might, you know, there's no treatment that, that is free of side effects that I know of. Uh, some have less than others. Some have different yeah. profiles of side effects than others. And, and this is very much a, what we call a preference sensitive decision. So we involve the patients very, very closely in the decision making. Some men have a huge range of choice because of the nature of the tumor that just it just they are eligible for a range of treatments. Some men sadly have very little choice. Um, and, and there are some treatments that, um, for instance, if you have inflammation in the bowel, um, so which we call Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, um, radio, they, they, they normally can't have radiotherapy because that can make the situation worse. If, you know, if a man has had lots of operating or have a, has a blood disorder with bleeding, you're not going to operate on them because it would be hazardous um, uh, to them. So, so that would sway you another way. So it's, it's a very interesting discussion. It's the bit I, I enjoy most is actually tailoring a treatment that is ne that is needed to, to the individual, you know, and and it's all those dimensions um, uh, are, are really important, uh, and it, and sometimes it takes a while, <coughs> excuse me, to, to get there, 
and the patients spend a bit of time with different specialists. Um, and they might go and see a radiotherapist. They might talk to some patients who've had various treatments. Um, our nurse specialists are, are brilliant because uh, they see the patients after all these treatments and are really very good at explaining the treatments and actually have a lot of mm -hmm. independence. If you're a surgeon, you have to believe in surgery. If you're a radiotherapist, you have to believe in radiotherapy. And so it's very easy to think that every patient should have the treatment that you're good at doing. Um, and so I, I, th I think the, um, the nurse specialists are hugely valuable in helping individuals negotiate uh, between, between the specialties. So thanks for explaining that so well, because another thing that's important to take on board is just because a friend of a friend had prostate cancer and they had XYZ treatment does not necessarily mean that you're going to have XYZ treatment. Care is so highly individualized. That's an important take home message as Absolutely. well. So don't, you know, yeah. go along yourself to have your own treatment, have your own discussion. I couldn't agree more. And, and also... Uh, the latest treatment summarized in, the, in yesterday's Daily Mail is, is, is also not necessarily the right treatment for the individual. And, um, and people will come. I mean, prostate cancer gets written about quite a lot. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, yeah. pe people often think, oh, I, I need to have that treatment uh, because it was talked about. It's new. Um, uh, but that, that isn't necessarily the right treatment for all individuals. And can you give us an idea, and it's a difficult question, um, but can you give us a broad idea about how successful treatment can be? And I guess more to the point, what factors can influence success rates? Again, is there anything that patients can do apart from tumor size, tumor grade? We all know that. Is there anything that an individual can do either before the diagnosis or even after the diagnosis that may influence the success rate of their treatments? So, um so the treatments I've described are done by human beings. All right. So this is not a tablet. Uh, we haven't talked about mm -hmm. tablets yet, but uh, we don't yet have a tablet that uh, can treat early prostate cancer. Uh, if your tablet works, it doesn't matter who gives it to you. Um, as long as you get it down you at the right time, you know, at the right dose, uh, it, 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 it should be effective on average ac across the population. Um, treatments, um, surgical treatments that require people's judgment and hands, uh, and manipulate d does require um, skill and practice. Um, the good thing about the UK is is that most of our cancer services now have been organised in such a way that when you need those skills, uh, you will be sent to a place that has those skills. Um, and that's a process that's happened in the UK, um, you know, over the last 10, 20 years. Uh, in the, and what we've done is concentrate complex services in certain hospitals. And that, that means that you have to travel, which I know people don't like to do, but it does mean that your case will get discussed by an expert team, probably to a greater degree than anywhere else in the world, um, on average, and you will be operated on or treated by uh, a, a real expert in that area. So in prostate cancer, it's, 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 it's a long time since everybody could do anything to anybody. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, individuals are referred to regional centers now to have their operations or their radiotherapy. So I think, I think um, listeners, potential patients, we're all potential patients, uh, can, be, can be very reassured, uh, despite what you hear about the NHS right now, um, that, that the organization of cancer services in this country is, is very, very good. Um, and so that the the treatment will be delivered well. Um, what can an individual do? Well, I think it's back to um, what's good for your heart, what's good for your brain. So, um, you know, be, if you're having mm -hmm. surgery, losing a bit of weight, getting fit, you know, trying to prepare for that. Um, having said that, you don't have a huge amount of time to do that. Um, radiotherapy, again, there's not much an individual can do there's a lot of things that, that the radiotherapy team will do for you to, to reduce that 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 risk. So I, I think I would I would trust the system. I would use the resources mm -hmm. such as this podcast, the charities, Prostate Cancer UK have excellent resources. Just click on it. If you don't like computers, you can call them and they will help you negotiate 
what can sometimes feel a very complex, complicated uh, pathway. Uh, and if you don't feel that you're getting the right answers, ask for another opinion. Um, everybody is entitled uh, in a cancer journey to ask for another opinion. Um, and, 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 you know, not everybody does so. But I think the resources now available to um, individuals, um, either through their GP, through, through um, the hospital, or through the charities, or through media outlets like this, um, uh, 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 are completely different to uh, the kind of information that was available five to ten years ago. Okay, and I'll put a link to Prostate Cancer UK in the notes with the show as well. So it just makes it easy for people to find. So are there any other treatment that we've not yet mentioned? Any other treatment options that we've not yet mentioned? You said you haven't mentioned tablets yeah, yet. So we, we spoke earlier. Um, you want to catch prostate cancer while it's confined to the prostate. Um, if you do that, it's curable. And I haven't answered your question yet. So uh, let's assume you've got a moderate grade cancer, um, which uh, is about... 0.5 cc, so about the size of a broad bean or something like that. That's 10 millimeters across. Uh, that would be very average. Uh, if that cancer is treated, men have between an 80 to a 90 percent chance of being free of disease um, at five or 10 years. And that's how we measure curability. Um, it's always a proportion and a time. Um, and, you know, if, if you if you make it to 10 years, you're probably cured. Um, you know, you're 10 years older, uh, the chances of other things, um, you know, uh, becoming more important than the prostate cancer is much more likely as you're getting older, etc. Um, but but that's so this is this is eminently curable condition if caught early. Mm -hmm. um, now, if the cancer mm -hmm. is spread um, beyond the prostate uh, and, and we, we we see people um in who you know for the first time i saw somebody yesterday uh, whose cancer spread their their psa their prostate specific antigen their blood test that they had was very high it was in the hundreds um and and their cancer had spread to bone and um i think it just bone actually uh but they they couldn't feel anything they were asymptomatic it was just they were just starting to lose weight feeling a bit unwell and the gp did a range of tests and found the psa high and the patient was referred that patient is going to need what we call systemic therapy. That means that we're going to have to treat every cell in his body. And that means he's going to have to take either pills or have injections. Um, and those injections can be into the muscle or, or into the vein. Um, because once cancer is spread, uh, it'll be spread to parts that you know, but it'll also may have spread to parts that you don't know. And again, we're, we're very successful in treating um, this. It, it sounds like um, like do, immediate doom, but actually just by manipulating the hormones, and we can do that with tablets or a little injection under the skin, um, we, can, we can get a PSA from 100 down to very close to zero uh, very, very quickly over days or weeks. And the cancer will melt away uh, and will stay melted away for several years, usually. Unfortunately, it's not a cure. The cancer eventually gets used to that environment and, and, and finds mechanisms of growing without the help of hormones. Um, essentially, it's just evolution speeded up. Yeah. And then what we do is start manipulating yeah. the hormones uh, or adding chemotherapy. Um, uh, and we're just starting to get into the field of immunotherapy, where we use the body's own immune system to try and help uh, treat the cancer. And we're looking into vaccines um, to boost the immune system, as well as um, uh, many other ways of uh, using and boosting uh, the host, the body's immune system to fight the cancer. But that's that's all fa fairly, fairly new. And what happens to a man once they have disease that's spread beyond the prostate, we call this metastatic disease, is that they will go on a, on a sequence of treatments and they'll usually start with hormones. Uh, now there's a whole range of hormones that we can use uh, and each one works on top of each other. We might then go to chemotherapy. Uh, we might then use some other drugs that are specific for certain subtypes of, of prostate cancer. And then you might be invited to um, into a clinical study of some of the new immunotherapy uh, treatments. And remember, in conjunction and all along the way, we have radiotherapy. So if you have a 
um, a, something that's spread to the bone, for instance, causing pain, we can give radiotherapy to that area. Um, uh, or we can give radiotherapy through the blood um, and, and deliver it with, with these traces um, that, we, that we now use. So it's a much, much more sophisticated, much better tolerated, um, much more effective regimen than it was when I was training. We had one thing we could do, which is to remove the testicles, drop the testosterone, and that was it. That yeah. was it. And then palliative it. care. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for those clear and detailed answers to my questions. As you know, I asked listeners beforehand to submit questions that I asked on their behalf. Are you happy for me to ask you a few questions from of course, our listeners? Delighted. I must stress at this point that it's very difficult to give specific and personalized advice to patients without a thorough knowledge of their past and current medical history examination findings and investigation results. Also, due to time constraints, I have summarized the questions in a way that I think retains the essence of what is being asked. Therefore, these answers should only be used as a guide and individualized care and medical management should be sought from one's own doctor. So our first question is, will cycling hurt my prostate? <laughs> Great question. Uh, I get this asked a lot. Um, some, some men do get uncomfortable after a long cycle and, um, and you can now buy mm -hmm. uh, a, a saddle that is split down the middle so that the, the prostate, which, which is a midline structure, it's in the middle, so the same, same line as my nose, um, uh, doesn't, doesn't feel any pressure. <laughs> you, you shouldn't really be sitting on your prostate when cycling. You should be sitting on the bones. Uh, we call them ischial tuberosities, but they're the bones that you can feel if you sit on your hands. <laughs> Uh, that, that that's what should be taking your weight uh, when you're cycling. So if you find you're slipping forward, you've got to sit a little bit further back in the saddle or adjust the saddle. If you find discomfort after after cycling, and we encourage cycling, I'm a cyclist, um, then then go to your cycle shop or go online and buy a a, a saddle with, which has the middle bit missing, um, and and you'll be a lot more comfortable. Very interesting. Okay, our next question. My 56-year-old husband has been diagnosed with prostate cancer, which has spread to his lymph nodes. Will SABR radiology treatment be an option for him? And if you can explain to us what that means. And follow-on question, what is the difference between that and conventional radiotherapy? Yeah, so it's a great question. So I'm very sorry to hear this, but, but um, the advances in radiotherapy that I spoke about earlier will be very, very helpful for this individual. Uh, ass assuming that the uh, radiotherapist can see uh, the lymph nodes that are positive, and I'm sure they can, because uh, otherwise he, wouldn't been, he would not have been told that they were positive, they would have been imaged probably with something called PSMA PET, we haven't talked about this. This is a, a tracer type of imaging. It's not MRI. Uh, it, it's, um, it, we use something that, that finds the prostate cancer cells, sticks on them, and then, and then there's a label on that that we can then see. Uh, PSMA PET is really sensitive uh, for prostate cancer that, that has spread. And if you can define where it's spread, uh, then yes, modern image-guided forms of uh, radiotherapy can be targeted very specifically at what we call the hot areas. And the beauty about that is that um, you can aim at the cancer but minimize any side effects to any tissue around it. And indeed, increasingly, uh, we are using now radiotherapy to, to manage what we call measurable disease. So any disease that we can see, uh, either at the time of diagnosis or indeed that develops uh, during the course of treatment, that we can localize, we can, we can zap with, with radiotherapy. And, and um, there are many different types of radiotherapy, um, but, but radiotherapy is getting more precise and it is getting increasingly image guided. Um, and that imaging can be guided by CT, uh, MR these days, there's something called an MR LINAC. Um, and um, there's a couple now in the UK of proton beam therapies that um, uh, some of the listeners may, may have read about. Uh, historically, um, uh, and they always used to get in the newspapers, 
uh, it was usually children had to go to Czechoslovakia or America to have proton beam therapy. Uh, there's now one in London. There's now one um, in Manchester, yeah. largely for treating children, uh, treating um, um, uh, brain tumors and also uh, tumors of muscle and bone, what we call sarcomas. But but I suspect uh, in time um, they the, the they'll be opened up for treating men with prostate cancer. Another positive development, hopefully, on the horizon. Okay, the next question is the question that we, the Prostate Cancer Brigade, need to know is what is the best way forward? Forget the expense, just tell us PMSA, is it the way forward? Oh, very, very much so. I, I like the idea of a Prostate Cancer Brigade. <laughs> it has a kind of I love it as well. <laughs> a military feel about it. No, I, and we're on a charge, right, to improve care. Uh, I, I, I think PSMA PET. I've, I've just I mentioned it in in relation to the last question. Is transformative. Um, we used to use something called a bone scan uh, to assess whether disease had spread beyond the prostate, and what that did, it it looked for changes in bone, and 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 made an inference. In other words, it guessed that the changes were due to the cancer. Uh, it wasn't a direct measure. Uh, PSMA PET is a direct measure. It sticks onto um, onto the outside of cancer cells um, almost exclusively. It, 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 these salivary glands light up and a few other areas do as well, uh, but it's incredibly accurate. Um, and if I'm at all worried uh, that there's a risk of spread, I will do a PSMA PET. Um, I'm very lucky. Uh, we can do it at UCLH on the NHS in certain conditions, there, there is that if the patient is very low risk, you're not allowed to do it because it is expensive, and we, we we do have to be careful with expense. Yeah. Um, if we spend something there, we can't spend it there. Um, if you want to buy a PSMA PET scan, it, it costs several thousand pounds. It's a very expensive scan, um, and so you have to be very careful with it. Uh, I think it'll get cheaper and cheaper, like all healthcare technology. Uh, there are many companies now making kits to make it quicker and easier and better. Um, and, and so I think it will become a lot more available than it currently is. But I think it's a very, very important part of what I call risk stratification, which is finding out as much as you can about the cancer um, in the individual at, at the first time of meeting. So at the time of diagnosis. Um, now, there are countries in the world where everybody gets a PSMA PET. Um, and that well, that country is Australia. For some reason, it's very cheap in Australia. I've never quite worked out why. Uh, and it's very common. It's very easily available in Italy as well. Um, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to get in the USA. And it's, and it's limited in the UK largely because of, it, of expense and complexity. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question. I have metastatic cancer. The one question on my mind is this. PSMA CT scan. Should this be the way forward? And what are its advantages regarding prostate cancer? So I think you've probably answered that with the previous yeah, question, I, unless you have something else I you want to add. I think he might be alluding to PSMA based treatments. So, um, so, if, so okay. if you've got, um, if, if PSMA can find the cancer cell and stick on the cancer cell, um, again, the next, the next mm -hmm. obvious thing to do is to tag it uh, with something that destroys the cancer cell. We call this theranostics. It's a, it's a funny word. Um, so diagnostics, gnostics, thera, thera, therapy. So the, you use the system that you diagnose the cancer with to treat the cancer. It's a very interesting idea. Um, and, and, and there are colleagues around the world, I'm, I'm not personally involved in this research, uh, currently researching the role of PSMA PET uh, with a um, toxic payload. So when it finds the cancer cell, it destroys the cancer cell. Um, I, I think that's looking very, very promising for the future, but it, but it, it's not yet widely available. Okay. Okay, the next question is, my neighbour who worked in the UAE had private insurance. They did a routine PSA and it was high. He was eventually found to have and was treated for prostate cancer. It would not have been picked up if he did not have a screen via private insurance. 
We are both 45, but my GP says there's no role for screening because I have no symptoms. What do I do? Okay, so um, I think the, the interesting thing about PSA is that, is that you can go to your doctor and ask for one uh, if your neighbour has had prostate cancer. So it's quite interesting. So um, the guidelines do permit that, um, and the GP just has to... Right. It's, it's kind of odd, but but it, they do permit it. So if you are worried about prostate cancer, you have a right to go to your GP and have a discussion. And it sounds like you've had a discussion. Uh, I think the GP has got it slightly wrong. Um, if you've got symptoms from prostate cancer, it's too late, right? Because, um, you know, you can imagine yeah. the, the prostate cancer, let's say the, the average prostate is about the size of a walnut. Um, you, 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 through the middle of the prostate is the urethra, the water pipe. The cancer has to be quite big, about the size of a golf ball, before it interferes with the flow of urine, uh, which would be the first symptom that you would get. Or, you know, heaven forbid, uh, you have pain in the shoulder from a metastasis much too late. Um, if you want to find uh, prostate cancer early, you have to use a screening test. And currently that's PSA. Um, now, at 45, uh, as we sp spoke earlier, prostate cancer is related to age. Uh, your risk of prostate cancer is exceedingly low. It's not zero, but it's very, very low. So I think the GP could have said, well, your risk is really, really low. Um, why don't we do this when you are 50? Um, so that would have been a very reasonable thing to mm -hmm. say. Um, but but, I, but I, I, I think the advice... Uh, to wait until you have symptoms is is incorrect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's exactly what screening is, isn't it? It's testing asymptomatic population, an asymptomatic population. Yeah, it's the definition of screening. Okay. Um, so next question is, I met my oncologist. He said I can have surgery or radiotherapy or brachytherapy. I know people from my chat groups who failed with each of these modalities. How do I choose? So th this goes back to um, our earlier discussion. And you're clearly one of yeah. these individuals uh, who has a cancer that lends itself to a number of treatments. Um, some, some men find this difficult. Yeah. Choice sometimes is, 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 is difficult. Um, I think that's, that sounds to me reassuring. Uh, that this isn't a type of cancer that can only be treated with one thing. Uh, this suggests to me that it's relatively low risk, relatively small, but everybody thinks that it would benefit you from being treated. So you, so you would derive benefit from treatment. And I think the, dis the discussion uh, with your um, advisors, and you will be meeting surgeons, um, uh, radiotherapists who are specialists both in external beam and brachytherapy, is, is really about the consequences of the treatment and the side effect profile of the treatments. They're all different. I think it's fair to assume that because there are options, they will all be equally effective um, for you or the individual. Um, and, and therefore, really, it's a choice about side effects. And they all have different side effect profiles. We discussed that earlier in the podcast. I think um, that's, a, that's a, a discussion with yeah. each of the people offering it. And, and then um, they will help you choose the best treatment for you and and you will make the right decision because the right decision is the one that you make uh, that you decide upon because you know yourself better than anybody else yep indeed okay my friend had a spot in his bones when he was diagnosed and had sabr and radiotherapy to the prostate i have another friend in the same position but he was started on chemo tablets, which is the right way. Again, this depends on, on the detail, and we, we don't have the detail. Um, you, usually one would do both. Yeah. Um, so um, as, as we discussed earlier, the chemotherapy treats the whole body. And then if there are any cells that you can't see, they'll be mopped up by the chemotherapy. Um, and the radiotherapy treats the cancers that you can see um, and, and will assist the chemotherapy in being able to eradicate that. I think the two are complementary. Um, in some individuals, you, you might do one before the other. 
uh, in other individuals, you, you might not do one for certain reasons that we don't fully know. But um, they're, they're usually used in combination, but sometimes what we call sequentially. So you'll do one first, see what happens, and then you may use may use the other. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. My oncologists have offered me various amounts of radiotherapy. 20 shots, 37 shots, and now another private center, five shots. What do I do? <laughs> this is a, these are very good questions. Um, I'm not a radiotherapist. That's the first thing uh, everybody should know. Um, what, what has been happening <laughs> over the years is, is, is we've, we've been reducing the number of fractions that men require. So that's the number of times that you need to be exposed to the radi radiotherapy. Um, historically, we used to use lots of fractions. So basically, you gave a little bit of radiotherapy Monday to Friday for several weeks, sometimes up to six weeks. So it's quite an ordeal going to the hospital every day. Um, but that meant that, that by doing so, you yeah. reduce the side effects by um, what we call fractionation. In other words, you know, spreading it out. Now that the, as we've discussed, now that the machines are better, we can target, uh, we, we, there's, there's less scatter, uh, there's less collateral damage, uh, you, can, you can get more radiation in per fraction, so each visit. And actually there's evidence accumulating now that uh, fewer fractions delivered well may actually be better uh, and more effective at treating cancer. So um, I, I think the fractions largely depend on the type of radiation therapy that's being offered to you. They will also depend on, on the amount of cancer that you have. I don't, I don't have that knowledge, so you'll have to listen um, to the people advising you. Um, but I would have thought that most of the types of radiation therapy that you are being offered uh, will work equally well. I think it's gonna be very, very difficult to tell whether one is better than another. So I think you'll have to make a decision based on, on, on your kind of personal circumstances um, and, and of course, um, the mm -hmm. private one, if you can afford it or if you're insured. Um, but, but I don't think that's necessarily the, the better treatment for you. Okay. I have a urinary catheter. Does this prevent me from surgery or radiotherapy? Um, so a urinary catheter is a tube draining the bladder. Uh, it sits in the bladder with a yeah. balloon um, and it's for men who can't pee. So if you stop peeing, it's an emergency. You go to um, A&E, um, uh, hopefully there's no queue, and somebody passes a catheter, a little floppy tube up the urethra, um, so through the penis, and then the urine drains out. Um, if this individual has a catheter in place, that means that they can't void, they can't empty the bladder naturally. Um, surgery would work very well because you remove the prostate you remove the obstruction, and then you, and then after the operation, you remove the catheter. So um, that will maximise the chance of that this individual um, peeing normally. Um, radiotherapy can be difficult with a catheter in place. You can get inflammation of the urethra and bladder, which can make having a catheter very painful. Um, and and you don't get rid of the obstruction if there is an obstruction present. So. There might be a big prostate there um, and radiotherapy will probably make that swell initially before it gets smaller. So just just on the facts that we know on, on face value, uh, with a catheter in, I would lean towards surgery. OK, yeah, that sounds entirely reasonable from what you've said. Uh, next question. The hormones gave me boobs. Will they go away? Yes. So uh, this is this is um, typical. Um, so we, we call it gynecomastia. Um, and and some in some men, it really is quite, mm -hmm. quite troublesome. It's painful as well. Um, and when it becomes painful, then mm -hmm. we can we can actually remove the breast tissue. Um, uh, th there are some drugs also that can be used. Um, no, it doesn't go away completely. It, 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 it gets smaller once you stop the hormones. Uh, but once once that tissue is developed, it stays there. Um, if, if 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 it's troublesome either through pain or discomfort, so when people exercise, they they, they find that they um, you know their shirt rubs. So runners particularly find that the breasts get very tender. Uh, then then um, 
you, you can have your, yeah. and this is available on the NHS, one can have some surgery to remove the breast buds uh, and get rid of the gynecomastia. So it won't go away completely, but hopefully in, 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 in this um, uh, listener, it will go away sufficiently so that he's happy um, uh, with, with whatever is left. And our last listener's question. I'm currently on enzalutamide, prostap injection and metformin clinical trial. And it's got my PSA down from 150 to 0.28. Is switching to darolutamide an option if it's deemed that it's got a higher percentage chance of survival than what I'm currently on? So um, I'm very glad to hear that uh, this correspondent has responded so well to treatment. That's really good news. Normally, when somebody responds well to treatment, we, we don't switch. There's, there's no incentive you know, to do that because uh, any new drug you bring in might have side effects. Yeah. And so I would be very reluctant to change um, a winning team. You know, So the current combination seem to be doing fantastically well. Um, the drug that um, is being alluded to uh, is one that is reserved for disease that hasn't spread beyond the prostate, um, and it is used when the PSA starts rising. So, if this disease was limited, the so if it was locally advanced, and uh, the PSA started rising on the prostap or enzalutamide, you could you could come in with this agent. Uh, but at the moment, I see absolutely no reason to do so uh, because he's doing so fantastically well. Oh, that's really encouraging. Great. I'm sure he'll be really happy to hear that. Okay, so the last question, Mark, is from me. And it is that you've managed many, many men with prostate cancer in your career thus far. Given the opportunity, is there anything that you'd like to say to patients who either think that they might have prostate cancer or have been diagnosed with prostate cancer? So might... Two questions in that. Uh, you're, you're, you're cheating. You're asking me two questions. So um, imaging is the most definitive test there is. So if you're worried, uh, it's, the, it's the MRI that tells you you don't have prostate cancer. Uh, and, and it does that through something called negative predictive value. It sounds a bit complicated, but that's the ability for a test to rule out a condition. PSA doesn't do that very well. Um, it's not bad, but it doesn't do it very well. And so if a man is truly worried about prostate cancer, um, then it, they, need, they need to somehow get to the MRI. And that, that's, uh, so they need to have a nice conversation with their GP and, and, and their urologist. Um, uh, MRI, there's, as we said, there's no radiation. There's almost no downside to it. But it, that's the definitive test. So that's the little bit of insider knowledge I want to give the listeners tonight on the might. Um, and the, the the second bit of the last question was um, about um, men who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer. I think ask questions, um, re, you know, go on the websites, reputable websites, Prostate Cancer UK website, yeah. and the link will be put um, on, on, on the website here. Uh, and, and don't be afraid to ask yeah. questions. And if you're not happy with the answers, seek a second opinion until you are uh, happy with the answers. So I, I want men to be more proactive in, in making sure they're happy with the knowledge, happy with the decision-making, and sure that they've had exceptional care. Well, that is excellent advice, absolutely, to all patients with any condition, absolutely. Brilliant advice. So in closing, Mark, I'd like to thank you so much for accepting my invitation to be interviewed on the show. Thank you so much in helping me to educate patients with the podcast. But most of all, thank you so much for your many years of long, hard work and dedication, which has translated into helping so many men with prostate cancer. Thank you. You're very kind. Uh, can I dedicate this to the patients that have allowed us to do research on them? So, as, as you know, Gail, this is a partnership. Um, we can only do research when patients allow us to do research. 
it, and it's it is it's a two way conversation, yeah. and um, we've managed to do big trials in imaging, MRI, all these new treatments, only because men wanted to improve the care for future men, and and you know many of them make huge sacrifices to take part in these trials. If they didn't take part in the trials, we wouldn't be able to do research. And many of the benefits that I discussed would not exist. So I, I just want to, in parting, thank all the men who have said yes to the invitation to take part in uh, prostate cancer research. That's wonderful. And again, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it useful. Please keep your eyes and ears open for upcoming episodes. If you enjoyed this, please hit the like and subscribe buttons to raise awareness of this podcast.